We say it every year, and I'm going to say it again this year. Divisional round weekend is the best weekend of football of the entire year. There's always some stinkers in Wild Card Weekend, you know, because huge variations in quality of the team. I'll, I'll say it nicely. It's generous. Generous. Once you get into the top eight, though, like, everybody's great. And that's usually where we get the best games. You know, I always think back, uh, like, one of the best football games I've ever seen. 2011, division round game, Saints 49ers, down to the wire, absolute war from start to finish. Like, every year we get division round games just like that. Because generally, if you make it this far, you're going to be evenly matched, or at least close to evenly matched against everybody else. So, uh, I'm excited. It's one of my favorite weekends of the year. Uh, every single matchup this weekend seems just insane, both narrative-wise, matchup-wise. Uh, I'm pumped. How are you, EJ? I'm great. Buckle up. Get the snacks. Just make sure you've got the calendar clear. you got your phone silenced. Like This is going to be really quality football. This is the best football of the year. This is what we wait for. This is... You know, the cream rising to the top, any analogy you want to use. And yeah, as you look down, as we were picking these games, it was like, oh, yeah, this could happen. That could happen. Oh, I can't wait to see how this matchup goes. And that's every game. And, I, you know, I don't I can't think of a weekend, you know, in the regular season or or even earlier in the playoffs where it's like that, where every single game is just going to be nails going to be great. Before we get into previewing all four division games, uh, do you want to touch up our uh, coach opening discussion from from last week? We recorded on Tuesday of last week, and then like the next day, uh, Belichick <laughs> moved on, and Carroll moved on, and Saban retired, and uh, you know, like b- between last episode and this one, the Huskies just all went either to the NFL or to Alabama. So <laughs> it's been uh, it's been a wild week on the coaching carousel. Uh, we had a retirement, well, not retirement, a mutual parting of ways in New England, as well as naming a new head coach in New England since we last recorded. Uh, what was your first impression of the Gerard Mayo hiring? It cut through the noise a little bit. We've been hearing that Mayo's the sort of been the hand groomed successor in New England from New England beat guys, folks that are inside that organization or, or bump up against it. Not very typically a talkative organization, the Patriots, but, you know, best kept secret or worst kept secret we talked about last week was, yeah, when Belichick moves on, if that's an orderly transition, Mayo's the guy. He's he's the hand tap successor. And then, you know, Vrabel shaking loose of the Titans kind of shook everybody up because they're like, oh, he's got history with New England. He's in the ring of honor and he went to the ceremony and oh, it's got to be Vrabel because he's the higher profile guy. But I think sort of, you know, New England loyalists were like, eh, it's not happening. Like if Gerard wants the job, it's Gerard's job. So I think it was the culmination of a couple of years worth of speculation, at least that that would be what happened. And that turns out to be what happened. And um, he's. I don't know. I like Mayo a lot. I think he's not the same coach as Belichick. He said as much in his opening press conference, which I really liked that learning mindset. I don't want to be surrounded by yes men. I want people who challenge my thinking. Um, I want to, you know, teach them to think. Right. And that is, I think, a great mindset for a league where we just saw it this year. Things change rapidly. Uh, week to week within a season within a team and you have to keep up you have to adapt you can't just say this is the way and we're going to do it and we're not going to change because you'll lose there's been uh, a lot of speculation over the years that the reason why Josh McDaniel remember when Josh McDaniel was going to be like a coach in Indianapolis for like 12 hours and then all of a sudden (laughs) it was oh no we're going back to New England um there was speculation that he went back to New England because he thought that he was just going to be Bill's successor. And then all of a sudden, seemingly out of nowhere, then it's like, change my mind, going to go be a head coach in Vegas. And that's when, you know, people first were like, okay, somebody must have told Josh that he wasn't the the heir apparent then because he wouldn't leave New England unless he knew he wasn't going to get that job. And then you package that with, I think it was one year later, Gerard Mayo got the extension. Um, and that's when people started kind of putting two and two, two and two together of like, oh, like that's that's who it is, right? Um, yes, the Vrabel thing 
certainly threw us for a loop a little bit because we know that Bob Kraft loves Vrabel. And if Gerard Mayo wasn't there, like Vrabel probably would have already been named their head coach. Uh, but the fact that they had been, for lack of a better word, grooming Mayo to be mm -hmm. this for, what, four, five years now, uh, it's about as orderly a transition as I think any franchise could possibly hope for. You know, even when, Again, they call it mutual. It wasn't mutual. Like they, 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 they push Bill out the door. But even under those circumstances, it's it's the most orderly transition that I think could have possibly happened. Certainly more orderly than the one that happened in Seattle, where similar kind of thing. Like Pete Carroll didn't want to leave, and they pushed him out the door. And they said he's going to be like a what's the term they use ambassador or like they they front pushed him upstairs. Or? They didn't push him out of the organization, but they pushed him off the sideline for sure. And yeah, I don't think the term has been settled on, or if it has been, I haven't heard. You know, nobody's really clear about what roles and responsibilities he's going to have. The bottom line is he's not going to be the coach of the team. He's not going to be an assistant GM. Uh, John Schneider is the quote unquote winner is the guy with the voice that's going to be listened to. He's consolidated his power. It was a move by Schneider to do that. And we'll see. It's a similar situation of the team saying, we don't, we no longer need what you bring us on the sideline. Do you want to do something else? And with Belichick, I think it was, are you willing to change? Are you willing to give up personnel control and everything else? And Bill said, nah. And with Pete, it was more, not nah, we've, we've seen what we're going to see. Uh, you gave us your plan for fixing this. We don't agree. Thank you for your service. We love you. We'll keep you around, but you don't get to coach anymore. What a lot of people don't realize, too, is a few years ago, um, remember when the Seahawks were really bad at drafting for like five years, six years, yeah. and all of a sudden they started nailing every single draft? Right before that, John Schneider threatened to leave. Like He's like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sick of this. Like I'm, I want out. And... That's when people above both of their pay grades, you know, made the decision of like, okay, John's gonna John's gonna take control of personnel, like full control of personnel acquisition. Like he everything's gonna go through him. And then all of a sudden they started nailing drafts again. And I think the fact that they nailed like three drafts in a row and kind of replenished the cupboard, so to speak, like yes, they didn't make the playoffs this year, and there's a bunch of reasons for that. Um definitely wasn't talent on the roster. Like they took some key injuries that really hurt them, but like the, the roster is talented. And I think that kind of convinced uh, the powers that, that, that be that like, I, I think Schneider is, is as safe as he's ever been because he proved that he was not the issue in the, in the mid to late 2010s. And I think that, you know, unfortunately for Pete, he's a legend, but he, did, he didn't get it done. He didn't get it done with a a very talented team that you and I looked at last summer and was like, hey man, like they can make they can make a real run here, and then they they fell flat. And at the end of the day, again, injuries are injuries, but it kind of comes down to coaching. What I'm trying to say as diplomatically as possible and with respect to Pete is I get it. Like John mm -hmm. threatened to leave. They they gave him more power. John used that power to draft a really good team, and that really good team disappointed primarily because of coaching. It happens, you know, again, Pete's going to go to the Hall of Fame. He's one of the best football coaches ever, but it was his time. It, it really was his time. And now the question becomes, who do you replace him with? I think if it was going to be an internal hire, we would have heard about that already. I don't think it is. But I do think that there are options around the league that are internal hire adjacent in, in terms of former Seahawks coaches that know the building, know the culture. Uh, but but could step in and, and potentially do a little bit more with the roster that is there. I know people are going to think I'm saying Dan Quinn. I'm not. And you and I have been talking about this guy over and over and over again, and it's former Seahawks coach, current Bucks coach, Dave Canales, who is against all odds with one of – one of the the worst cap situations in the NFL and a journeyman quarterback in Baker Mayfield. Like this team is one game away from the NFC championship. And that a lot of that is because of Dave Canales. If the Bucks beat Detroit this week, which is very possible, Dave Canales 
to me, would be by far my number one choice if I was the Seahawks because, like I said, he knows the building, he knows the culture, and shit, Geno Smith looked a lot better with Canales in the building than than this year. He did, and I think the Seahawks are sort of skipping along the top of the waves in the coaching search here. They've you know they've requested interviews with Ben Johnson, Canales, Mike McDonald, like. They're hitting all the high notes, and the reason that those guys want to be there is not only because it's a head coaching job in the NFL, but this is not a team, as you mentioned, bereft of talent. Like There are a lot of good young players on this roster, and they do have more potential than they showed this year. Do they need some things? Yes, but they're, again, back on the drafting good foot. We think that they will have another solid class and can fill those holes. They did pretty well in free agency, even during the season with trades. So this is a team on the rise. This is not a team that's bottoming out that needs a full rebuild. So it's a very attractive spot to come in, take a good roster, touch it up and put it over the top. If you listen to John Schneider's comments from his press conference, I think it was yesterday, there were definitely some morsels to kind of pick out of the mess in there. And he leaned a little bit, well, not a little bit. He spoke directly about quarterback development. And he was definitely leaning towards the offensive side of things. Now, that doesn't mean I think a guy like Mike McDonald would not make a fine choice for the Seahawks. I think Seahawks fans would be really happy if Mike McDonald ends up being their next head coach. But Canales has familiarity within the building. Ben Johnson is, I think, the probably most well thought of offensive mind in this particular round of hires, even though there's Canales and Slowick you know, no shortage. This is a great hiring season and they're hitting all the high notes. So I think they're going to come away with their top choice that fits them really well. Canales, I think would be up to speed a little bit quicker than some of the other coaches, but that's not necessarily going to be Schneider's main focus. It's going to be who's going to be the best for the Seahawks long-term and who can take us, you know, back to the Super Bowl. This isn't about getting a little bit better or getting out of the cellar. This is a team that almost made the playoffs, not playing great, Get a good coach in there, maximize that roster, and you're going to be playing this next weekend next year. What do you think is going to happen with Shane Waldron? And I know Bears fans are thinking uh, he's going to be calling plays in Chicago. Um, I Again, I think if Waldron was going to take over for Pete, we, we would have heard that by now. Mm-hmm. Like I, I think that would have been clear. Yeah. He's not taking over for, uh, taking over for Pete. He's going to go somewhere else. In the back of my head, I think there's a possibility that if Canales gets poached to be the head coach in Seattle, that Waldron then just goes straight down to Tampa Bay. They just swap. Yeah, it's possible. Because, <laughs> you know, as far as like hitting the ground running, it's it's very similar offense. Like the language is similar. It, it wouldn't be. I mean, obviously, it's about as far of a flight from Seattle as you could possibly get in this country. <laughs> but I would say well, in it. terms of. <laughs> easing into it like mm-hmm. i i think that'd be a pretty pretty clean swap there yeah the heat around waldron as a sort of head coaching candidate has absolutely died down i, I he may get a couple of interviews but i think those are more favor interviews he really i think is looking probably next year in an offensive coordinator position because of the sort of luff down the stretch whether that was his fault or not it certainly diminished his star we were hearing things at the beginning of this season and even through the middle of this season that he was going to be right up there with ben johnson and uh i, I think slow gained momentum throughout the process so they kind of passed each other waldron was going down and slow was going up but that talk has cooled he could end up as a head coach but i don't really see where he fits because of all the other coaching candidates that are out there um, and their relative pedigree. So I think he will be an offensive coordinator some somewhere next year. I don't think it will be with the Seahawks. Tampa makes sense. Uh, you said it. A lot of fans in Chicago are excited about the possibility of adding him. Uh, I, you know, he'll have a job. It'll be in the NFL. It won't be probably with the Seahawks in any capacity. All right, let's get to division round uh, predictions. Well, predictions and preview, really. We're each going to make picks, and we're going to talk about why we're, we're why we're making those picks. Um, I went five out of six in the wild card round. EJ, I think, went three out of six. Yeah, I was three. Uh, three. That was five hundred because I took over the uh, curse duties for the weekend. Apparently, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny when I picked the Texans, I only like half believed it, 
And then they ended up having one of the most lopsided games yep. <laughs> of the week. Because I was like, I don't know, Cleveland's defense is really good. Uh, but it, even even my own reason for, for taking them, which was, hey, this is a different team with, with Stroud mm-hmm. and Will Anderson on the field. Even me, the Texans fan, wearing the Texans starter jacket, still underestimated them. Yeah. And so I, I only kind of like give myself half credit for this because even though I picked them to win, I didn't see that coming because good God, like they eviscerated them from start to finish, multiple defensive touchdowns. They rattled Flacco. They got consistent pressure. Stroud was phenomenal. Like, I mean, they look like they could have beaten anybody in the NFL that day. Like, I don't care who walked into Houston that day, Baltimore, Kansas City, San Francisco. I don't give a shit. Like, anybody would have lost to them. Now, are they going to keep that going in Baltimore? Eh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready to go that far, but I, I think I think Houston has proven that that they're not just, you know, the plucky new kid on the block. Like, they're a legitimate threat to everybody. Like, they can beat anybody at any given time. When CJ plays like that, everybody's going to have – a tough time keeping up. And I mean, everybody except for like three or four teams in the NFL, not in the AFC. He played lights out. The Browns also collapsed. Flacco, you know, disappeared in a puff of smoke. We had several sort of epic collapses last weekend, which again is the reason that we both think this weekend coming up is the better football weekend because, you know, the Cowboys, we'll talk about them in a bit, just the wheels fell completely off. The Eagles, you know, disappeared in a puff of smoke. There were a bunch of them. The Browns sort of went down. But to your point, the Texans defense was all over it. The pass rush was there uh, on both sides with Gernard and Anderson. CJ was unstoppable, unflappable, super cool, very accurate, made some ridiculous I'll say bail save throws, fadeaway jumpers. I mean, whatever you want to call them. He made some, you know, unreal throws that rookie quarterbacks typically don't make. Most quarterbacks typically don't make, rookie or not. And yeah, it definitely had the feeling of doesn't really matter who's in front of us today. If our quarterback is playing like that, you're not coming away with a W. Now, when it comes to uh, to picking these division round games, which is obviously our, our our main goal today even as well as Houston played last week and even though they they demonstrated that that nobody is safe against this team I don't care if it's a rookie quarterback rookie head coach rookie offensive coordinator like young roster like I I get it they showed nobody's safe but I'm still not a hundred percent ready to go like full homer <laughs> and say they're going to walk into Baltimore, of all places, and and knock off the one seed. It's possible. Mm-hmm. It's very possible, but highly unlikely. Like I think, I think Cleveland. I mean, hell, even Cleveland themselves, very different team. You know, when they're at home versus on the road. You look at like just the defense alone, best defense in the NFL when they're at home. Like number thirty-two <laughs> when they're on the road. Like it's it's the weirdest dichotomy. Um, and I, I think Houston, again, home versus on the road, uh, it's two very different conversations. So could Baltimore have beaten Houston in Houston last week? I don't think. I don't think that even Baltimore would have won that game. But Baltimore's not going to Houston. Houston's going to Baltimore. And in the cold, in the wind, it's a very windy stadium, by the way. People don't realize that. One of the hardest stadiums to kick in in the entire NFL because the wind does really weird stuff there. Um, but just at the bank in a playoff atmosphere against somebody who I think is should be the MVP in Lamar Jackson with an extra week's rest, very well coached, extremely talented. I'm just stacking reasons on at this point. But I think Houston's had a dream season, but at some point that dream is going to have to come to an end. And unfortunately for me, I think it's going to be at Baltimore. I think Baltimore wins this one as well. I the game's going to be a lot closer than people think it is. I think Baltimore will win, but I don't think the Texans are going to roll over and play dead like some of the teams did last weekend. You talked about an envelope where the Texans could win this. Yes, they could win this. If Lamar comes out flat, I don't think he will. If Stroud goes supernova again, 
he might <laughs> because he's been more consistent on that bent than a lot of people realize, especially folks that haven't watched Texans football all year. Houston could pull the upset. It is possible. But you give Monken and McDonald two weeks to plan. You give the entire team an extra week worth of rest. That's what you get when you're the top seed. They get to play at home. I feel like Baltimore is a lot to handle. They have played as a more complete team this year than any of the other years that I can think of when they hit the playoffs. And, you know, they were hot, but they didn't have balance. We'll talk about another team in the AFC that really has found balance. The Ravens have played great balance all year. Lamar has played exquisite football. The defense has been amazing, easily one of the top five defenses in football. They're not going to make anything easy. And when the Ravens start taking things away, and they will take things away from the from the Texans, when you, they start taking things away, it is much more difficult to play the way that Houston played last weekend. Loose and easy, everything's working. They had the running game, they had the deep passing game, they had the short passing game, their defense was working. It was just all clicking. When the team on the other side doesn't allow that to happen in in any of the phases, you have to start going to things that you're not as comfortable with. The Ravens will absolutely force the Texans into those situations. We'll see how the Texans respond. I think they'll buck up in certain places, fold in others, but the sort of overall weight of everything you described at Baltimore, two weeks rest, Lamar playing like an MVP. The coaching is extremely solid. Head coach, offensive coordinator, and defensive coordinator all sort of in, I was going to say tandem, but it's it's really triplicate, right? There's three of them doing it at a very high level. I don't think the Texans overcome it. I do think it will be an entertaining game. I don't think in any way it'll be a blowout. I think the Texans season does end and Lamar and the Ravens move on. The one thing that kind of gives me pause, and, and, and this is maybe the Texans fan of me grasping at straws, because I was trying to like go through every stat I could find, every little scrap of film I could find of like, how do they do it? Like, if if Houston's going to win this game, how do they do it? And I went back to the Ravens' schedule, and I was like, okay, let's l- let's look at the offenses that Baltimore's played against that are similar to the Texans. I mean, obviously they played against the Texans as well in Week One, but Week One Texans are not the same as January Texans. Like that was the first game of the Stroud and D'Amico era. Um, and they got shelled in the first quarter in that game and then kind of, you know, put up a fight in the in, in the second half. Um, but they played against Miami. They played against San Francisco, you know, two similar offenses that, you know, have similar makeups in terms of personnel groupings and, and, and concepts and everything like that. You know, Houston is fourth in uh, in their usage of 21 personnel this year. San Francisco and Miami are just ahead of them, you know, at number two and number three. So I was I was looking at how Baltimore specifically plays against 21 personnel because they're going to see that probably a lot against Houston. Uh as long as Andrew Beck is healthy. He's he's dealing with a back injury, but I I assume he's going to be playing. I mean, if, if Houston's without their fullback in this game as odd as that sounds, like that's going to completely throw a wrench into this whole thing. But <laughs> if Andrew Beck is playing I'm going to assume there's going to be a lot of 21 personnel usage uh, and there's going to be a lot of, you know, play action, deep shots down the field, all the normal Texans type stuff. And so I was looking at how Baltimore plays against those personnel packages and the specific coverages they use. And what I found interesting was that Baltimore played against 21 personnel from San Francisco and Miami differently than they did against Houston. And maybe part of that is, they, they weren't really sure what to expect from Slowick and Stroud and his first game. They didn't really have anything to study. But then I was kind of going through all the other games that they played against 21 personnel, and I, and I noticed that against quarterbacks with stronger arms, they respond to a fullback being on the field differently. And Stroud, we know he's got a hose. Like, that's something they knew about Stroud going into this year, just because they could watch him at Ohio State and be like, oh, yeah, he's got an arm, Right. Um, but against Purdy and against Tua, they played a lot, and I mean a lot, of half quarter quarter, especially when the ball was on the hash. So they'd play quarters to the short side. They play cover two uh, to the field so that they get uh, a hard flat to the field to help against the screen game. You know, they didn't think that those two quarterbacks, Purdy and Tua, 
had had the type of cannon necessary to hit that whole shot against a half field safety to the field anyway. And it was wildly effective. And they were mostly in nickel as well. Like even against 21 personnel, they were mostly in nickel, but it was a 3-3-5 nickel. So Hamilton would kind of play like a quasi linebacker spot to the field. You had Michael Pierce, um, you know, lined up as a, a six technique over a tight end. Like it was it was hilarious, honestly. Like so, <laughs> some of those refs just tossing Kittle around. Um, but you know, it was a, it was a very interesting style and I felt like they were, they were molding the coverage to the quarterback in the sense that they didn't feel threatened when they did that. Contrast that to how they did it against Houston. And it was like, we are in cover three. Like we are not giving the post. We are playing cover three. Fuck you. We're not doing anything else. And it was such a different style of defense. And when we've talked all year, about Mike McDonald, you know, coming out with kind of a new defense every single week and playing everybody differently. Like that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. They were not going to give CJ Stroud the post in that game. They just weren't going to do it. And so I kind of think that we're going to see the same thing again in this game, which is against 12 personnel and against 21 personnel. We're not going to see any of the too high stuff that we're, we're used to seeing from Baltimore. It's cover three. We're playing you straight up. Like you're going to have to mount 10, 11 play drives and just run into a meat grinder. Because if we try to do all the fancy stuff we normally do, CJ and Nico were one throw away. Like San Francisco had them. Like they had them schemed up. You know, they got Brandon Ayuk like running down the field, four yards of separation, just giving a little double move to a half field. Like they had it, but like they didn't have it right because they don't have they didn't have the offensive line to hold up and they didn't have a quarterback that honestly had an arm to throw it 65 yards down the field guess what cj stroud can do that and the texans offensive line is better so i think that we're going to see an oddly boring defense from baltimore even though stylistically houston runs a lot of the same stuff that san francisco and miami do we're going to see an oddly boring style from baltimore because i think they're going to be scared shitless to play anything exotic I, I, I get it. It's a rookie quarterback. You think, oh, we're going to throw the kitchen sink at him. He's not going to know what he's going to see. I don't think they're willing to do that. I really don't think they want to test it. I think they're going to make they're going to make Houston just out execute them rather than try to trick them. Because if they try to trick them and they get caught, mm -hmm. the same thing can happen to them that happened to Cleveland. And trust me, you don't want to fall behind against Houston. Not with those offensive tackles against Jonathan Grenard and Will Anderson. You don't want to fall behind. So uh, prepare for a boring game if you're not a Ravens or a Texans fan. Uh, but I think that's kind of the only thing they can do. I think it'll be a boring first quarter for sure because they, like you said, they don't want to. It's like two fighters feeling each other out in the in the first round. Like nobody wants to open themselves up to the kill shot. And you mm -hmm. can do everything right against the Texans. You can get pressure into Stroud's face, and he's going to fall back and literally flick it 35, 40 yards to where nobody is, and then somebody's going to run under it. Like, he's got that kind of arm with a guy in his face falling. You know, every mechanical thing you can think of for quarterbacking is wrong. And he literally just <whistles> yoink. Yep. And it's 35, 40 yards. So you could do everything right and still get burned. So I think they're going to be somewhat conservative. Again, try and keep the lid on, keep the cap on, not get burned. No big plays, at least on defense in the first quarter. So I would imagine McDonald, he's going to vary some coverages, but I don't see the kitchen sink kind of zero approach because he knows. He knows he doesn't have the guys to play that right? Because you're not going to have enough coverage in the back end to hold up against somebody like Stroud who needs one shot. And if it comes open, he can hit it and he's not going to hang mm -hmm. anybody up. He's going to put it over their head and they're going to keep running. So I think conservative is will, you know, playoff football is always a little bit conservative because again, nobody wants to make the big fatal mistake. And then it gets more and more desperate, which is one of the coolest things about playoff football is as as you get past halftime and the desperation cranks up, this is it. If we lose this, okay, now we got to take some chances. But I don't think those chances are going to be early for the Ravens on defense. It is kind of funny how how playoff football, it's it starts out slow and then everything happens all at once. You know, like the Cleveland-Houston game. Yeah, okay, they're trading shots in the first half and then, oh my God, it's over. 
Yeah, it was <laughs> you know? two interceptions from Flacco, and you and I were messaging during that, and I Flacco threw the first one, and I thought, well, that might be enough to tip the scales right there, as well as the Texans are playing. And you're like, I'm not, I'm not ready to. And like as you were typing, I'm not ready to. He threw another one, and I was yeah. like, how about now? You feeling good now? So it does. It's it. You know, things hold even, and and everybody wants to kind of hold fast and and take those first couple punches and keep standing. And then, you know, somebody breaks, lets the guard down, takes one on the chin, gets a little woozy, and then, you know, it gets desperate pretty quickly. And I think that's one of the greatest things about playoff football is you can just feel it. When you've watched as much playoff football as you and I have, you can literally feel it. Like, I find myself getting anxious. I don't get anxious watching football games, even for my team. Maybe that's because they haven't won anything in a long time. But, you know, (laughs) I don't get super anxious and almost there were three or four of those games last weekend where I was sitting here. And I was like, why am I like, why am I like clamping my arm on the chair? <laughs> like, well, especially like, uh, like the, the Cowboys game. It's like, okay. Yeah. It went down seven, nothing. It's like, uh, okay. Pick 14, nothing. Dallas is marching down. Take a sack on third and five, have to punt 20, nothing. And then like you, you saw, you saw the panic like, set in, right? Yeah, <laughs> it, it was like somebody fell into an icy river and they were wearing heavy clothes and they're scratching and clawing and trying to and they just they drown. They're yep. gone. And it, it, again, it. it's slowly and then all at once. And that's how that's how playoff games happen, because that desperation, man, it. it, it Everybody's causes feeling games it. to tip. Yeah, everybody's yeah. feeling it. And whoever manages that pressure and plays through it and lets that allows that to affect them less is the more likely winner of the game. And that is much easier said than done. Now, two teams that uh, are very experienced in terms of handling that pressure in the playoffs, Kansas City, Buffalo. There there obviously is pressure on both of them for different reasons, but I think uh, they've both handled so much pressure because they keep going deep deep into the playoffs year after year. So again, it's two veteran teams. They're kind of used to it. Like they can, they can handle that desperation a little bit easier uh, than say a, a young Texans team can. Um, but that's not to say that there isn't still pressure on both of them. There's pressure on Kansas city because they're trying to establish a dynasty, be remembered forever. There's pressure on Buffalo because they don't want to lose to Kansas city again for the third time in four years in January and have that be the one franchise they can't get over. So there, there is a certain, uh, there is a certain sense of pressure on this game, but I think both teams have done this song and dance so much, especially against each other so much at this point that if anything, this could be the most even matchup of the weekend. Cause I don't think that either of them are just going to crack. Right. I don't think it's going to be like, like a Cleveland. I don't think it's going to be like a Dallas or, or, or even Philly where like one thing goes wrong and they're just done. Like I, I think if any game is going to be a back and forth, you know, just constant lead changes going down to the last possession. Like this is the one that, that truly is even to me. Um, that being said, I am going to go chalky and take (laughs) Buffalo. And I, I have a few different reasons for that. Um, but I also want to caution people against this narrative that, oh, the chiefs are fraudulent. They only won Mm. because it was 30 below and the dolphins were banged up and yada, yada. Like, no, like even me, who's been, a a healthy skeptic of the chiefs this year. Like even I don't think this is the same chiefs team right now that we saw two months ago. Like this is a better offense than they were two months ago. They're still an elite defense. They're still incredibly well coached. Do they have flaws? Yes. But I don't think they're as glaring uh, as they were say around Halloween or early November. Like this is a real team. Like this is, uh, unfortunately for Buffalo, this is Kansas City peaking at the right time. Mm -hmm. I'm just taking Buffalo because I think their peak also is happening at the right time. And I think their peak is slightly higher than Kansas City. And I'll kind of get into that in a minute. But like, I want to caution people against taking Buffalo in a landslide here. No, it's not going to be. It's going to be the closest game of the weekend. 
it's going to be an awesome game, and it's because of the setup. These two fan bases, these two teams, they're very familiar with each other. They do not like each other. Uh, they've played each other enough that there is vitriol between the fan bases, and it's going to be an awesome game. It is going to be close. The weather looks like it's going to be a little bit better, <laughs> better in Buffalo than it was in Kansas <laughs> Ish. City. Ish, not great, but not whatever that was where you're sending fans to the hospital with frostbite. I'm going to go with Buffalo as well. Betting against playoff Mahomes feels like sacrilege to me. And yes, this Kansas City team is not the same team from the middle of the season. They were in disarray. There were arguments. There were flaws. They were losing games they should have won. They have rounded the corner. They are in their mode, uh, which is it's the playoffs. We win these games. We know how. They looked much more complete. Over the last three weeks, they've started to develop more of a receiving game. Now they had a bunch of drops in the Miami game. I'm not going to hold that against them. The ball was basically a cinder block. If you've never played when it's really cold, it is extremely hard to not only throw the football in the wind, but also catch it. Um, We saw guys like Kelsey, who typically have very good hands dropping the ball. So I'm not going to hold that against them. But this Buffalo team is different as well. They're bringing more balance than they have to this fight before. Again, Buffalo has always leaned pass heavy. That pushes Josh into hero ball. They've not been able to run the football. This team, this Buffalo team can run the football, and they do. They don't forget to. Other Buffalo teams could run the football, but they would just handily forget to and end up with like six carries for the entire game. This is not that Buffalo team. Even with that, both teams peaking at the right time, Steve Spagnuolo is as in his bag as any coach in the NFL right now. That guy is like, he's the guy that's at the roulette table at like 3 a.m. He's been there since 9, and he's got a stack of chips so high he can't even see over it. Like, (laughs) you just can't roll him off right now. That defense is playing at a ridiculous level. And it's going to make things very difficult on Buffalo. And just like I said about the previous game, Kansas City is going to take things away that Buffalo wants to do. But both of these teams are equipped for that. They both have a lot of balance in the team. They both have very good defenses. They both have super weapons at quarterback. So it's not going to be one of those one mistake games where one pick gets thrown and the other team goes, well, we're not going to keep up with them. Look, you got Mahomes on one side. You got Allen on the other side. They can keep up with just about anybody. Buffalo is going to have to earn the win. This is going to be back and forth and little things are going to become big things in this game because that's the way playoff football is so nobody's going to give up in the middle of the second quarter or the or right after halftime but they're both going to have to keep banging away and it's going to be close it already feels like an instant classic it feels like a nail biter i can feel myself getting anxious just talking about it because it is going to be a very evenly matched game but i've got a hot take for you for a very cold game okay i think i think mahomes throws a pick in this one now, okay. he's never famously, he's never played a road playoff game. That's an insane stat for a guy that's played five years of NFL football. He has zero Six road playoff appearance. Point. Yeah. So I'm going to go with all the December road games he's played, which is about as close as you're going to get. In He has 12 interceptions in 13 December road games in his career. So about one a game. And I feel like this Buffalo team is more than capable of picking one of those off. Now, little things being big things, is that going to sink the Chiefs? No, like they can also put up points. That well, that's that's what's interesting about it is even if he's thrown basically a pick a game on the road when it gets to winter time, he's also one of the few quarterbacks where it's like, yeah, he threw a pick. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like hey, and they're fine, <laughs> and it's the same with Josh Allen. We had this narrative. We talked about this. Oh God, you're going to get the great Josh, but then you're going to get the Josh that throws all the picks. Like Josh didn't throw that many picks, and he accounted for was it 42 or 44 total touchdowns this year? I think it was 44. Off 44 the head. led the NFL most touchdowns that someone was responsible for in the NFL. So. I feel like the interceptions, we all just kind of have this itch like, oh, no, Josh is doing it again. No, he's not. (laughs) He didn't throw that many, and he accounted for 44 scores. So if he throws a pick, it's all right. He's probably going to run for a touchdown and throw for another. So he's going to more than make up for it. And it's the same with Mahomes. But I bet Mahomes throws a pick in this one. 
when could be a big factor. It's late in the game and they're driving. They need some points and he throws a pick. That could be a bigger deal. If he throws one that gets tipped and picked off in the first quarter, yeah, Nostradamus, whatever. It's not going to matter to the overall game. The one, well, not the one, the main reason (laughs) I'll say. And it's it's funny because we've been heaping praise on Kansas City over and over and over again while also picking them to lose. Uh, But the reason why... I think Buffalo is going to win this game is because if we're talking about the transformation that both of these teams have undergone and both of them have been shaky during the regular season, especially in the middle mm-hmm. of the regular season, we were looking at both of them like, are either of them good? Get <laughs> like, it together. You know, like we were, we were really, we were genuinely questioning both of them. Right. But the transformation that Buffalo's undergone, I think has been even more significant than Kansas City because their philosophy has changed. Mm-hmm. Like it's not just about, oh, the Kansas City receivers learned to catch or more accurately, oh, they threw to Rasheed Rice a lot more. Like that's kind of <laughs> what happened. Was, oh, they figured out their rookie's pretty fucking good. Um, and against Miami, they ran the ball a lot with Pacheco. That's what we've been asking them to do and they did it. But like philosophically, Buffalo's offense just doesn't look the same. No. Like at all. You know, since week 12, when they made the switch at coordinator uh, after that Denver game, which the fact, man, the fact that they were six and six and it ended up as a two seed is is really a testament to, to how different they are now. But yep. um, if you're going back since week 12, they went from 25th to 15th in under center runs. So they're about average in terms of running from under center, but they were way below average before. Yep. They were like bottom quartile. Was not in, something they did. And and it, it and we we talked over and over again about like how their offense was was simplistic and predictable and just not like yes there were some efficiency metrics that favored them but they just couldn't score right because they just made it so hard on themselves they had a lot of similar issues to to what the Eagles offense had but Buffalo actually changed they started running from under center more now they're slightly above average in under center runs their two most common runs since week 12 are outside zone and power. It's not just shotgun duo all day. Um, Now they still are fifth in EPA per play, so they still have an elite EPA per play, but they're balanced. They're balanced while having that EPA, and that's what's critical, right? So they can actually keep drives going and finish them in scores. They're not gonna stall out at the 40 yard line like they were in the first half of the season. Now on the Chiefs side, defensively, they're third in yards per uh, yards per attempt allowed uh, versus shotgun looks at about 5.78, so 5.8, which is amazing. They have the fourth, I guess you could say, fourth lowest EPA per play allowed as a defense versus offenses that are lined up in the shotgun. But under center, which is what Buffalo's doing more now, they quote-unquote drop to 10th in yards <laughs> per attempt allowed. So they're just a well above average instead of like straight-up elite. But in terms of EPA per play allowed, they go all the way down to 19th when the offense is under center. Uh, they, they allow a lot more explosive gains as well when the offense is under center. So all that to say, the new style that Buffalo plays in, which is placing a larger emphasis on being under center, hard play action fakes, shots down the field from under center, you know, running outside zone, running power, you know, being more multiple and more balanced being more I mean it's not Shanahanian but it kind of is in terms of you know the direction that they're going like they're not all the way there like they're not all the way a Kyle Shanahan style or else they'd be like fifth (laughs) in under center runs but like they're more to that side of the spectrum now and that side of the spectrum against against the Chiefs defense specifically tends to have more success so Again, neither of these teams are the same as they were in October, but the changes philosophically that Buffalo has made are more significant, and they happen to to be moving towards the style that the Chiefs can struggle against a little bit, specifically um, because they run so much too high stuff. I worry a little bit about Spags in this game. Like I, Again, it's going to be low scoring, or low scoring-ish, when you have two super weapons at quarterback on the field, but... Ultimately, I think the changes that Buffalo has made have been more significant and will carry them slightly 
slightly ahead of Kansas City. Again, not going to be a blowout. Maybe like a two-point win, three-point win max. But had to choose one of these teams, so I got to go the Bills. Yeah, Bills are funny now. They have momentum, and I, momentum is a loaded word in football because people tell you, oh, momentum doesn't exist. I'm not using momentum in the football sense. I'm actually using it in the physics sense. Like an offense in motion tends to stay in motion. And again, that's not motion at the snap. I mean, they seem to be able to, with basically all the same players and most of the same plays, get that rhythm under Brady that they could not under Dorsey that keeps drives going, keeps defenses guessing, makes second level defenders unsure whether they're coming forward or going backward, which is exactly what you want. You want them sort of flat footed, not like, oh man, this is a pass. We can just pin our ears back and and go get them. And the Bills ability to do that since the change to Brady at OC has been so noticeable on the field. Their ability to just continue drives because they call the right play at the right time and have success is way greater and again we're talking about no serious personnel changes a lot of the same style and philosophy but it just works better because it gets employed you know to the right person at the right time the balance is there and they maintain motion which equals momentum in football games all right let's get to the third game of the weekend green bay san francisco uh, again, going to give myself only half credit for for picking the Packers game right. Uh, I said they were going to beat Dallas. I didn't say they were going to absolutely obliterate them. So that's, I still think I underestimated them. Not going to give myself full credit for that one. Um, my main takeaway from that game before we get to San Francisco is, oh my God, Jordan Love. I I really can't remember the last time I saw a quarterback start where he started Mm -hmm. in the beginning of the year and then end where he ended. Well, he still hasn't ended, but you know what I mean? I do. Like over his last nine games, his TD to interception ratio is what, like 21 to three, something outrageous like that. Like he looks phenomenal. And in any other year, you know, if you didn't have Kevin Stefanski get into the playoffs with four different quarterbacks taking snaps for him, you know, if you didn't have D'Amico Ryans doing everything that he's done and Shane Steichen coming like one snap away from the playoffs with friggin' Gardner Minshew back there, but in most other years, you know, let alone Kyle Shanahan in there, in most other years, I would have voted for Matt LaFleur for coach of the year because of the development job mm-hmm. that he did, not just with Jordan Love, but with all the young skill position talent too. Dobbs, Watson, Dottavian Wicks, um, you know, the, the two tight ends they've got. Grave, yeah. It's crazy. Like, it's it's the youngest offense in the NFL, like, by mm-hmm. a pretty significant margin. And they just put up 48 points in the playoffs. Like, these guys have never played playoff football be- before, at least together. And they put up 48 points, and it looked easy. Like, they were on the road, and it looked easy. Jordan Love was spectacular, whether it was under pressure or a clean pocket. He was just throwing pinpoint dimes. The arm strength was incredible. His deep accuracy has improved tremendously. Like, I go back to his tape at Utah State, and he couldn't throw a fucking fade route. And now, with Micah Parsons in his face, he's flicking a sail route 40 yards down the field like it's nothing, right? Just the development job that Matt LaFleur has done to get all these kids ready to go. It cannot possibly be understated how impressive it is. Like, the Packers are a real threat here. Like, Mm -hmm. right now, Green Bay's favored by, or not Green Bay, uh, San Francisco's favored by nine and a half. No way. Like, no way. I am am not taking San Francisco by nine and a half in this game. Like, I think that's borderline disrespectful. And I say that as somebody who, who roots for the Bears. That is disrespectful to the Green Bay Packers. And it's disrespectful to this explosive offense, you know, let alone, you know, the other side of the ball. You've got one of the best interior pass rushes in the entire NFL going up against a very leaky interior uh, offensive line for the 49ers. I, I don't know, man. Nine and a half seems super rich. It seems super rich. Like, yes, I'm taking San Francisco to win this game, but I think you're out of your mind if you think they're going to blow out the Packers. Like this, again, screams three or four point game to me. 
like a true back and forth affair. I think Green Bay is a lot better than people give them credit for. And I think that San Francisco has more weaknesses than people think they do. And I cannot imagine this game is a blowout. I would be more shocked by that than I am shocked by the Packers obliterating Dallas last week. I'm certainly pretty shocked with Green Bay obliterating Dallas, but youth at quarterback has been served so so, so far in the playoffs. CJ and Jordan Love both played exceptional football for their teams, and both their teams won in a walk because of it. Um, that's just great news for those two fan bases moving forward. Um, there's really no question at that position for either of those teams. And the fact that, yeah, Green Bay is the youngest offense going in the NFL. Now, the point line, I'm with you. I think it's too high. But I'm also with you that I'm going to take San Francisco in this game because barring a rash of injuries like the one that knocked San Francisco out of the playoffs last year, which was... <laughs> kind of apocalyptic in terms of a team's chances and all the things going wrong at once outside of something like that I think in this game they probably remind the Packers of how young they are and uh, to paraphrase Cat Williams a Chrysler 300 does look like a Rolls Royce Phantom (laughs) until the Phantom pulls up and I think (laughs) Kyle Shanahan and the Phantom are going to pull up and that offense and that defense are going to remind Green Bay that they are a very good football team and they do deserve to be there but that they're not winning this weekend. Um, if they do, it'll be one of the most exceptional stories in the NFL this year, period. It, the development story is already one of the best. If they beat the Packers straight up, not due to injury, or sorry, if they beat the 49ers straight up, not due to injury, that would be amazing. It would be um, as surprising as the run Joe Burrow made in 2022, the year before, quote unquote, the Bengals are ready and they went deep into the playoffs, it would be very surprising to me. I get the feeling San Francisco's rolling into this game um, not overconfident, but very confident of the outcome. I feel like Shanahan, again, this is master to pupil, Shanahan to Lafleur. I think it's going to end up looking that way on the field at the final gun. Not even when, if the Packers lose. I don't think it's it's going to be because of the Packers' offense. Like I said, I think they're going to score. Like, I think they're yep. going to score a lot in this game. Mm. The one reason why I don't think Green Bay will be able to keep up in the end is just because I trust Joe Barry about as far as I can <laughs> throw him. Like, they, they played great against Dallas. I was going to say, I said of, that last week, and then I was just waiting for him to fold, and it but th- never That was like happened. an avalanche scenario, though, right? Yeah, it, was. it was like, oh, they're up 20 to nothing in like 10 minutes, and then all of a sudden, like, you get Dak. He's throwing a pick on fire zone when they ran slants, and Darnell Savage is reading it the whole way, and then it's yeah, the wheels nothing. The wheels came off all at once for both sides for Dallas. And it's so funny, too, because the picks that Dak threw, he threw them because he was being overly conservative. You know, playoff pressure, man. I'm telling you, that's just playoff pressure. You're down, like you said, you're down 20 early. And then guys that haven't done that all year, Dak has not done that all year. I mean, he's thrown some of those picks, but not like that. It was pure panic. It was, oh my God, I got to get points right now. And he literally started to press. You could see him press. And the engine just blew up. Like, that was it. They were done done at that point. It, it was it was one of the most fascinating games I've ever seen just because it, you, for a veteran quarterback, yeah. you, just, you don't expect them to fold no. like that. And I don't mean that he gave up. I mean that he... It's really more he got folded. <laughs> he, yeah, he just ran out of answers. And it was so yeah. plain to see. You were like... I remember the point in that game where I looked up and I thought, because like you, when we were talking about the Texans and the Browns game, I was like, before Flacco threw that second bad pick six, I was like, oh, I, you know, they could get on a roll. The Browns could get on a roll. They could get back in this. And I felt that way in the Dallas game until I didn't. <laughs> like you looked up and you were like, oh, no, they're they're not going to find it. Like, Mm -hmm. they can find it. They have the talent to. They could do it at any minute. That's a big strike offense has been all year. But they're not going to do it today. They're just not. They are sputtering in every phase. And it, it sort of hit me. It washed over me. I was like, oh, no. 
like Dallas is going to do it again. They they fooled me all year. I was on the Dallas train this year. I put out a tweet said, "Hey, I bought in." I said, "No, this is different cuz the joke is, oh, is this your year? Is this it? Is this what it looks like?" That's always been the joke with Dallas. I thought they looked very different this year and I thought they would finally get over that hump. And what's fascinating about it really is you know, even even though <laughs> the same Green Bay defense gave up 30 points to Carolina. Um, like, schematically speaking, I didn't think that Joe Barry, like, schematically was really controlling that game. This was not like a, a Mike McDonald, like, oh, he has all the answers, right? But even the two picks that Dak threw, like, it was on a whip route that Jair just made a great play, but mm-hmm. he literally had CD on the corner route. It was, they were playing cover one cross. Like, you have a one-on-one with CD in the slot. He's got leverage because they gave him a free release because the, the DB's playing from like an eight-yard shelf. Like, you got, the, you got the throw, Dak. Make the throw. And he didn't do it. He instead on third and five decided to throw a whip route and then Jair was, was sitting on it and, and picked it off. And then, you know, this is a, a Cowboys offense that's thrown more slants than anybody else in the entire NFL. And so Darnell Savage, you know, they called fire zone and he was literally just looking at Dak like, are they going to throw it? Oh, shit, they're going to throw it. Okay. And then he right took at it. me. <laughs> yep. You know, but it, it's not like Joe Barry made some like crazy exotic no. call. Like he called cover one and then like the most basic fire zone you've ever seen. And Dak just short circuited. Yep. So I don't even think that Joe Barry really like, you know, other than maybe getting his his DBs prepared against the type of concepts sure. that like Dallas likes to run. Of like, hey, they don't run uh, quick outs to the field. They run return routes because they don't want to risk throwing to a hard flat. Watch for the return route. And then Jair was like, okay. Like, all right. I'll give him credit for the preparation, but it's not like he called an amazing game. His dudes just played the, the amazing, right? And so what I worry about with, with San Francisco is when you're going up against Kyle Shanahan, you got Kyle Shanahan against Joe Barry. And... <laughs> Kyle doesn't really give you tendencies like that to prepare for. Like he's not going to give you, uh, hey, every time we we go into four strong on second and short, we're running three slants. Like they don't do that. They have like 10 different concepts. You know, it's not a, uh, hey, we never throw flat routes to the field. We're going to run return routes. Like they don't give you those kind of tendencies that McCarthy was giving Joe Barry. So all that to say, I I worry a lot about about Joe Barry getting eviscerated in this game and giving up just enough points that Jordan Love and and Matt Lafleur can't keep up offensively. That's ultimately why I'm taking taking San Francisco to win this thing. Um, but next year, let's just say a change is made at coordinator. Uh, <laughs> let's just say, oh like, could you imagine? Like just, and this is a nightmare scenario for Bears fans. So earmuffs if you're a Bears fan. Um, Jesse Minner in Green Bay. <laughs> Don't even change anything talent wise. Matt Lafleur, Jordan Love, that same offense, and then you just pluck Jesse Minner out of Michigan, and you put him in Green Bay. They win the division, like easily, like going away. I understand Detroit's great. We're going to get to them in a second. They would not beat that Green Bay team. That's the one missing piece they have is a, is a defensive play caller that is as good as Matt LaFleur is an offensive play caller. Once they get that, I'd put them up against anybody. Like, yeah, then, truly, they're, then they're the Ravens. Yeah, yeah, then they're basically the Ravens at that point. You're correct. Yep. And it terrifies me. I hope they keep Joe Barry. I really do, <laughs> for selfishly, but I don't think they would. Yes. The resistance does not want to assassinate Joe Barry. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Uh, all right, speaking of the Lions, let's get to Tampa Bay, Detroit. I'm going to rip the Band-Aid off here. I'm taking Tampa. People called me crazy for taking Tampa last week against the Eagles. Another team that yeah, beat the Bucs. We both took Tampa the against year. the Eagles. So we, we oh, both you took Tampa too? Crazy. We we both took Tampa in that one. So I don't know why. That's I what got me to 500. <laughs> oh, there you <laughs> like go. If I there lost that one, I would, have been, I would have been two of six. Yeah, it wouldn't have been great. So, But... You know, it's a similar reason to, to to what we were talking about in that show. Like the Tampa team that lost early to Detroit is not the same Tampa team they are now. 
No. Like they eviscerated Philly because if you look at Tampa over the back half of the season, a lot of their issues they had early on, they significantly improved, Mm -hmm. especially when it comes to run defense, right? Um, And I, like to put it plainly, I don't trust Detroit secondary. I really don't. Like not against Baker, the way that Baker's playing against these receivers, you know, (laughs) Trey Palmer, anytime he wakes up pissed off, apparently he's going to get like 300 yards. So uh, if he wakes up pissed off this weekend, I uh, pray for Detroit. But I just, I don't, I don't trust them to be able to handle Tampa through the air. And at that point, it comes down to, okay, can Detroit's offense answer over and over and over again? Theoretically, yes, because they've done that multiple times this year. But schematically, I think they're going to have some issues because they're going up against a very blitz-heavy defense from Tampa Bay. Like, they blitz at the third highest rate in the NFL. And Jared Goff, when facing blitzes, he's he's been fine. Yeah, he's but okay. But he hasn't been super dominant, right? And, and they don't get explosive plays against the blitz. Like, you look at how San Francisco's handled it. Like they get explosive plays against blitzes. Whereas Detroit... Because they rely so much on empty protections, like 70% of all their protections this year have been empty protections, meaning they have five guys in protection, no running backs helping, no tight ends helping. Like they get, mm-hmm. like it's very, um, it's very Bengals ish, honestly, where like the Bengals were just like, we're going empty, we're going to let Joe sort it out, we'll throw hot if we yep. need to. Like Detroit does the same thing. Like they answer blitzes by throwing hot, which is why they're 25th in average depth of target against the blitz, they're 24th in big time throw percentage against the blitz. Like, yes, Goff has a high completion percentage and they'll get yak and everything like that. And, and he's thrown more touchdowns than almost everybody against the blitz. But that's because people blitz him so much because they know that they're going to protect with five and they're going to limit Detroit to just throwing hot over and over and over again. And they can do that like they've done it this year. Mm-hmm. But at some point, you know, Detroit's going to have to look at themselves and say, like, hey, our corners are getting dusted right now by Tampa by Tampa's receivers and they're giving up all these explosive plays which I think they're going to do because they've done it all year and at some point it's like we're going to have to answer scoring drive after scoring drive with 10 11 12 play drives of our own because we're getting blitzed every other play and so our average depth of target is going to be like fucking four yards and again it's it's possible Mm -hmm. but you better make zero mistakes like you better make absolutely no mistakes if every single drive because you're because of the style that they play against blitzes every single drive is going to have to be 9 10 11 12 plays you can't mess it up and so again i i think detroit could win this game that way but it's a hard way to play football whereas tampa can come out and and like throw one left hook and just like with you know what we saw with packers and cowboys all of a sudden you're down 14 and you're like, uh-oh, <laughs> like we got to move here. And I don't I don't know if they can. So that's that's kind of the main reason why I'm taking Tampa here. It's not because I don't have respect for Detroit. I'm just saying stylistically, this is not the type of team that I think they want to see right now because they're more like, yes, they're gritty and they're tough. And it's all the things we love about the Lions. But sometimes uh, being like the methodical boa constrictor can work against you in a game that mm-hmm. has a running clock and i worry that that if they get down a little bit early i don't know if they can if they can handle that you know does that make sense it does make sense i don't think they'll get down early if they do i'm with you it's going to be a difficult climb and i think their chances to win decline significantly if that happens I actually don't think that'll happen, though. I think they'll trade blows with Tampa Bay. The Lions are straight up rolling. I really thought the Rams would knock them off. We both picked Los Angeles to win that game, and they almost did. Like They're a point short. Stafford put in another warrior performance in Detroit. What's new? But I really think the Rams had a better chance than the Bucks to knock the Lions off, and the Lions are on a roll. Matchup-wise, I think Detroit's going to advance here. Everything you said about how they deal with the Blitz is true. They're going to have to come up with some explosive runs, and they did against the Rams. Now, that's not going to be through the middle against Tampa Bay. Most likely, Tampa Bay has been pretty solid playing middle runs, but with Gibbs, you can get outside. 
find those cracks in the slot, get 10, 12 yards on a rush that keeps a drive moving, you know, keeps you out of that 11, 12, 13 play drive range because you just picked up 15 in a chunk. So they're going to have to have some explosive runs and they're going to have to get a little bit of yak and that is going to be difficult. They have receivers that are really good at it, but the Tampa Bay corners are really good. Corners and safeties both are really good at limiting that. They're great Mm -hmm. tacklers. They are heavy tacklers and they're sure tacklers. And they do not let you get a lot of free yards after the catch. So if you're throwing short of the sticks consistently, that's probably where you're going to end up. And that's going to put more pressure on Goff to try and have to make some of those throws. I wish Jamison Williams would evolve into what they drafted him to be. Hasn't shown really any sign of that this year. A couple of flashes, but not enough. If there was ever a time, Mr. Williams, if you're listening to this, this is the game. You want to break off a 75-yarder over somebody's head? Like, go get it. Like, do it this game. That will help the Lions tremendously because if they get a little bit of a lead, they can stand and bang with anybody because that's the way they're built. That's Dan Campbell's philosophy. They know they're going to play tight games. They know they're going to play tough games. They've done that all year. I feel very confident about the Lions in that type of game. Getting down early, I would feel less confident. Getting a little bit of a lead early, I would feel like they're just going to kind of grind this one out and roll on that, you know, the crowd was electric. We knew it was going to be, but I would say even more so than I thought it was going to be. I might have even underestimated that, and I thought it was going to be amazing. Um, This does feel like, and it's felt like this for most of the year. We were seeing Detroit fans early in the preseason who were traveling for this team. They, this felt like the Detroit year, and I think that carries them in this game against Tampa Bay, along with their ability as a football team. It's not just the crowd you know, pumping up a bad team. It's the, pr- the crowd supporting a very good team that is fundamentally sound, and I think beats the Bucs this weekend. I think no matter what, we're getting a really fun NFC championship because <laughs> either we're getting the two teams that everybody kind of hoped for to be good this year, you know, San Francisco and Detroit going to, you know, two amazing offensive play callers, Ben Johnson versus Kyle Shanahan. Either we're getting that in the NFC championship or we're getting like an NFC North battle Royale, you know, part three of green Bay versus Detroit, or, and this is the scenario that, I, that would just break every single, you know, expectation that we had going into this year. What if we get Jordan Love versus Baker Mayfield in the NFC Championship game? Like, I'm all for it just because of how out of left field that would be compared yeah. to what we thought going into this year. Pure or, chaos. Or, or Kyle Shanahan uh, against Dave Canales. Mm-hmm. You know, Canales being, again, somebody we're bringing up as like potentially the new Seahawks head coach. Um you know, maybe a preview of what's to come in the NFC West. Like, no matter what happens this weekend, I think the NFC Championship is going to be an incredible story, an incredible matchup. So I'm kind of okay if any of them win. Uh, <laughs> Lord knows, like Detroit, like I'm, I'm, I'm pulling for uh, their fan base because they've been through so much. And if they win, absolutely 100, percent I'd, I'd feel great for them. But at the same time. You know, as a, as a child of a, a lifelong Sooner fan who's rooted for Oklahoma since the '60s, I, I feel like I would be uh, doing my dad a disservice if I if I didn't pick Baker this week. He's he's just the right amount of spiteful that uh, I think he's going to hold C.J. Gardner Johnson's comments to, against him and 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 have a, a vintage angry Baker game. Did you see that, by the way? I did see that, and I. You know, there's two sides to the Baker coin, and I think Baker is just, he's been a lightning rod for his entire football career, even at Oklahoma. Um, And he fell sort of out of love with football. And actually, in the, I think it was in the pregame stuff this last weekend, they talked about how his stint with the Rams was what rekindled it. When he got there, McVay said, Man, you got six games. Who cares? Yeah. Like, just play. Just, what are you going to lose? Nobody expects you to win anything anyways. Like, get out there and sling it. Have a good time. Like, get back to having fun playing football. And Baker was like, really? And McVay was like, hell yeah, that's the Baker I need. Just go out there and, you know, do your bit. We know who you are. 
Like, I've known you since. And they, I think, famously shared a flight going to the Combine. Yeah, that's where and they first so, met. Yeah, so they've known each other forever. And Baker credits that as sort of taking the cap off because just his other stops, he'd been places and people had said, well, do this, but don't do that, right? You, you know, do the good football part, but we need you to tone this part down. And it eventually just builds up sometimes when you're in the wrong situation. And we'll say this about players or coaches, like it's just time for a new start. It's just time for a new place. He needs a fresh light. He doesn't look like he's having fun playing football. Baker's having a ton of fun playing football right now. Um, and you can see it in everything. Did you see the water bottle clip? Yeah. <laughs> so the equipment manager hands him a water bottle. He tries to spray him with it. Like mid-game. Totally reminded me of like, uh, you know, San Francisco. Like big drive for the 49ers, right? Joe Montana. And he's like, hey, isn't that John Candy? <laughs> Everybody's like, what, Joe, what's the play? Like, just loose in the middle of a good football game, having a great time. And Baker's back there. And so, yeah, if he moves on, great stories all around. Nobody expected Tampa to even be in the playoffs. Forget the NFC Championship if that happens. If Detroit keeps rolling, obviously a great storyline. They've waited. I said at the end of last week's piece, like, yes, I'm picking the Rams, but, man, I really want Detroit to win the game because I just – I think Detroit has earned it and their fans have been amazing this year um, and amazing for a very long time. This is, this feels like their moment and I hope they get it. So we'll see. No bad, no bad outcomes here. We've got four great games this weekend. Uh, hopefully if you're a fan of any of the teams we talked about today, we properly fired you up. Uh, if you happen to be interested in getting yourself uh, some, some NFL merch, whether it's for your team or, just generic NFL merch, or or even or. better, bootleg NFL merch. You can find all those things uh, at our merch partner, Homage. I'm actually wearing a, a Texan starter jacket from them right now, and it's very, very comfortable. And all their hoodies are just so damn soft, and their T-shirts are so damn soft. So if you want any sort of bootleg uh, apparel or apparel to rep your favorite team, they also have crossover stuff for like NFL Blitz or... Uh, or, you know, dead. if you're just feeling like you really want to support Jason Kelsey, whether or not he retires, they have New Heights stuff, too. That's true. Yes, they're the New Heights uh, merch partner as well. And anything you get doesn't even have to be for our podcast. It can be for New Heights. But if you get it at the link in our description, we get a cut of it and it directly benefits the show. So thank you to all of you who do that. Thank you once again to Underdog for sponsoring this week's show. Uh, hope you guys uh, made it through the first round of playoff best ball. Still a few more rounds to go. Uh, we also have uh, pick em entries. I'll actually throw up my pick em entry right now for those of you who missed it uh, for this weekend. You can either tail it or, uh, honestly, if you know what's best for you, don't tail it. Yeah. Go completely against it, knowing my history. Mm -hmm. Either way, it's up on screen for you. Uh, you guys can find that at the link in the description below as well. If you use promo code BOOTLEG, uh, on your deposit, they will double that up to $100. So they will literally give you $100 free dollars if you happen to deposit $100. Not saying you have to, but that's the limit. Uh, and then also you get access to a free half yard special for this weekend as well. So thank you to all of our sponsors. Thank you to our executive producers over on the Patreon. Iken, Marat, Consti, Andrew, Liam, Connor, and Mike L. Uh, one more note, specifically to our EPs on Patreon or anybody who's interested in becoming an EP, uh, we're going to have our Ring of Honor Q&A uh, live from the Shrine Bowl when EJ and I are out there at the Cowboys facility. Uh, <laughs> they won't be using it that weekend. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I know that's mean. Uh, <laughs> I had to. Um, oh, but we'll, we'll be out there during the Shrine Bowl uh, during the weekend of the conference championships. We're going to be doing our uh, Ring of Honor live Q&A from there. Uh, right after the uh, the conference championships. We'll be in touch with all you guys to kind of get schedules because I know that all of you want to be there. But if you're interested in becoming an EP on Patreon, uh, you can also find that linked in the description below. All right, EJ, I think I got through all of it. Any parting words? I'm looking forward to it. Like I said, I'm going to silence the phone, get the snacks, kick the chair back, lock the door, get a nice frosty beverage, and enjoy what is truly one of the best weekends of football going. All right, we'll see you guys next week where we're going to be previewing the conference championships. Uh, not entirely sure what the timeline on that's going to be because, again, we're going out to Shrine Bowl 
uh let's see when, when do we fly out friday uh, thursday 20 25th 25th i think so like uh, basically a week from when we're recording this um so ideally we'll probably record the conference championship preview and have that out by the time we get out to frisco for the shrine bowl um but again just kind of watch us on twitter and we'll tell you whenever that's coming out uh, anyway we will or see you guys subscribe to bootleg on youtube and hit the bell you'll know when it pops up that's probably the more efficient way <laughs> kind of <laughs> all right we'll see you guys next week